Um, welcome to our afternoon. Ooh, sorry, welcome to our afternoon keynote. Um, uh, we are thinking about audiences uh, for science and discovery centres and museums this afternoon. Uh, what motivates them? What is concerning them? Do they even know what a science centre is? It's one of those age-old things. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Gary Moss. Um, he is the chairman and the co-founder of Brand Vista, uh, which is now part of the, of the uh, definition group. Um, it, as a customer and colleague experience um, organization, his first client was in fact Alton Towers. He actually works across the whole Merlin Group. I've got like a lot down here. I'm gonna, uh, if you go, if you go to our website and you actually see his portfolio, it's like way too impressive for me to uh, to read out here. Uh, but do do have a look at, at all the work that Gary's done. Um, Chaz put us in touch actually because uh, Gary is uh, sits on the board of trustees for the National Space Centre. Although your bio says you got all your space knowledge from the Asda Book of Planets. Ah, oh, what's that say about that? <laughs> ah. Uh, anyway, the, the amazing thing for us for this keynote, and the amazing thing about Gary actually, is that he has donated a considerable amount of time, of researcher time, to do some hot off the press and in-depth research for us um, for this conference about uh, in, into what people think of, of science centres and what is motivating them. So it's incredibly bespoke research, um, and you know, absolute massive thanks to you for for doing this for us. And uh, please do come to the floor. Thank you very much. Right. Good afternoon. Um, the Asda Book of Planets, 599, available now. Really, really good. I recommend it. It's kept me in the, in the, in the space centre for this long. Right, good. Now then, I've got a little maths question for you to begin with this afternoon. Um, not too difficult, don't worry. Uh, how many telephone numbers can you remember off pat? Without looking on your phone, how many? I saw a shaking head there. But aren't your family the people that you love? I see lots of shaking heads. Anyone more than three? I knew, I knew there'd be someone because you're scientists, aren't you? So I thought there must be quite a few. I don't believe you. I just don't believe you. But anyway, it's not many, is it? It's not many. And I suppose there are numbers that you use all the time. Well, um, I wanted to take about 1992 when I was called in to see uh, the retail director of a big national retail company, 567 outlets across the UK. And he said, Gary, I want you to research my telephone number. Now, um, it wasn't one of those easily memorable telephone numbers. I don't know if you remember the one that was 282020. Do you remember that one? Yeah, I see a few nods there. That's good to see. It wasn't one of those. It was like 01713864214 or something like that. Completely unmemorable, but it was a telephone number. I could not get my head around the fact that he wanted me to research this on a national basis. Go out, find me a national representative sample, and come back with how many people remember my phone number. And I, I really thought he was, he was pulling my leg. But he said, no, I spend so much money on advertising. I put it out in newspapers every, every week. Surely people will remember my telephone number. He said, I remember it. He said, oh, well, he's looking at it all the time, isn't he? He's going through his newspapers. Of course, nobody remembers it. So I said, Mike, because uh, that was his name. Mike, whatever you do, save your money. It's zero. Now, Mike was suffering from something that we, uh, I think we all suffer from time to time. He wasn't walking in his customer's shoes. He did not know the shoes that his customers were wearing. He had been so engrossed in his world that he couldn't see beyond this ridiculous request that he had. And it's very difficult to know your customer's shoes, what's going on in their lives, their context, because they change their shoes every day of the week. And not only every day of the week, but sometimes they change them four or five times during the day of the week, depending on the occasion or the circumstances. And I suspect that all of us here would find it very difficult to genuinely walk in our customers' shoes. So um, I'm going to just uh, keep you in the same, the same kind of era at the time. Uh, anyone know what that is? No? <laughs> it's Strange Ways Prison, 1990. Um, for those of you who were around at that time, there was a riot, and it was horrible, and it was the front page of all the newspapers and on the, in the, in the uh, TV as well. It was horrible. Horrible riot in Manchester. That's the key thing to this little story, a big riot in Manchester. And I'd just started work at an advertising agency called J. Walter Thompson. And they said to me, Gary, I, you're very young, and it's time for you to go and 
find out about some customers we've got. And our customers are prisoners. And they've been rioting in strange ways. So we've worked with a charity. And we'd like you to go in, get under, under the skin of the context. How do they get involved? The psychology of the whole thing. So off you go, Gary, to the strange ways prison. So this is a good example here of how you have to go to the nth degree to understand the motivations, the attitudes, and how people are looking at the way things that you do in the broader context of their lives. You have to know their shoes. This was probably the most extreme example I was involved with. And I'll uh, just share with you one terrifying question that they asked me. And the terrifying question they asked me is we all got together next to the uh, toilet block in Strange Ways Prison. That question was, what football team do you support? <laughs> now, if I say Manchester City, I've got a 50% chance of dying at that moment. If I say United, I've got a 50% chance of dying. If I say Liverpool, I'm dead. <laughs> Aren't I, Chaz? <laughs> <laughs> So that's a, we'll come back to that later on. You may be wondering what I'm talking about. So we've done some research for you to help you understand what's going on in your customers' lives. Um, and so you can walk a little bit better in your customer issues. I'm only going to share about a third of that research now. Um, as you can see here, we've got, um, we've got a big mixer. But on the right-hand side, you see what we've done. We've taken a national bespoke sample for you. Um, the people who go out, they are mums of kids um, who are school age. And we've done it national representative right across the country. And we've asked them a set of questions that we've, we've shared with, with Sharon and Chaz and a few of the others as well, just to make sure we've got a good, a good sample. I'm going to share some of, the, some of those uh, um, answers with you. And we did that the week before Liz Trust decided to destroy the British economy. So there will be a few, a few things that are just a little bit less bad than they will, probably are at the moment. But the attitudes to you and your, your sector will probably be the same. But also, we've done, uh, over the last 18 months, 750-odd focus groups as part of our work. And I'll put that all together here. We've been going through and working out what are the themes. And they've put out just a few themes of that, uh, of, that, of that work. So just to show you know where that all comes from, those are some of our current clients. Is it all? Yeah, it's all working. Just put a check. Current clients. We're working with some of those for a long time. Alton Towers, as Sharon said, I've been working with since 1991, which is where I met Met the great Chaz. Um, here are some other ones over time that we've worked with, so you can just see the whole mix of stuff. And here's just a few on the, on the, on the periphery of your market, things like David Lloyd, Green King, other leisure companies like that. And um, we put this all together and we've mixed it. And this next slide is something I've been working on quite a lot over the weekend, and I'm really proud of it. We've mixed it all together, and this is what happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Took me ages. <laughs> anyway, that's the, <laughs> that's the end of that. Right, so this, <laughs> this is the way it goes. So it's all about knowing your customer's shoes. And there are three things we're going to talk about today. No, it's not going to be too in-depth, and I'm going to go at a fairly brisk pace. But um, people are feeling stressed. I say a little less stressed than they were last week than they are this week. But it's never been a better time for your sector but there are some hurdles to clear. Right, here's a few things here. So these, we ask people, what are you worried about? And these are, this is a proportion of people... Oh, I'm going to have to put my glasses on. Um, a proportion of people who said they were very or quite worried about these things. So here we've got the cost of gas and electricity. 84%. That's a huge proportion saying they are very or quite worried. Uh, recession, financial crash, 83. This is the week before... All those tax cuts of last, of last week. The cost of food, very or quite worried. What a stress uh, country we are at the moment. Pollution, I mean, those of you who have other interests in other scientific areas, climate change, the cost of petrol, all over 70% in those top two boxes of feeling worried. Single-use plastics is there as well. I reckon that a few years ago to see single-use plastics, 61% being very or quite, or quite worried would have been remarkably high. Um, but of course, you see that is the, well, it's a little bit behind all these other issues. And these two things, biodiversity and that little old thing that we used to call coronavirus. So very worried we are at the moment as, as, a, as, a, as a nation. So 70% of people in our survey said they were already turning down the heat. I don't know if you've turned on your heat recently. 
Uh, my wife decided it had reached the point, as I sat there covered in blankets last week, that we had to put it on. So uh, the heating is on in our house, but 70% said this. But of course, that's, um, that's all very well and good. That's the context. But this is perhaps something we should be more worried about, is that 65% of people in our national representative sample said they're worried that days out were becoming too expensive. Top two boxes, 65%. Worried about what's happening. So that's something we should be thinking, ooh, that's not good. And when you look, about, look at these uh, other figures here around what they're cutting back on, there's that 70% figure I had talked about earlier, 55% reducing their spending on other non-essentials. I've left two out there because those are the two we should be interested in. 43% having fewer days out. That is potentially half our market thinking, I'm cutting down. I'm not going out as much. The cost is too much. I'm too worried much about the future. There's going to be less days out for me. And at the bottom there, look at that other figure, 28% saying they're trying to find more free things to do. So I'm not going to pay anything. I'm going to go to the park. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm going to do all those sorts of things rather than pay for a day out. So they are cutting back very quickly. So that's the sort of the background there. Uh, people are feeling very stressed, very pressured. As I say, this research was done two weeks ago. But there has never been a better time for your sector, I don't think. So let's go through a few things here. First one is I did some focus groups for Alton Towers, which I spent a lot of my time over the years doing. And what we do is say, right, now, can you just shout out all the places that you normally go to? And they shout them all out. Then I ask them to, in their own minds, in their own, in their, in their own, using their own criteria, to put them into categories. And having been doing this since 1994, I thought, woo, this is what's going to happen here. A bit, and I normally know that it's going to be this sector, this sector, and that sector. But there was a new sector emerged just about five or six years ago, and it was something that people described as, or places that you go to where you have a bit of fun, you go as a family, but you learn something as well. And for the first time, and I've probably done three or four hundred groups over time, I've, I've, over all these years, I, I really have no idea. Um, they put this category separate and they put things like discovery centres and science centres and zoos into that, into that category. But it was the discovery centres and the science centres that were, were driving that sector. I've not seen it before and it's never gone away since. That sector is growing. As you can see that figure, we've got this figure here, the global world is, I hate this word, but edutainment is protected to grow to 3.7 billion by 2028, one of the fastest growing leisure sectors that there is. Now that's good, that's a structural deep trend that is obviously working in your favor. And in our research, we found that 38%, and I just said, nope, top of the list, the first thing I wanna do, I prefer educational days out. 38%, that's really high. That's really high when you think about what you're set up against there. So that's another good and sound and positive thing that you can see working in your favour. And this is another one that comes out of qualitative research that we've done globally in China, all over the place recently. Parents are worried that they're not having enough time with their kids. They're not having enough time to explain things, to talk to them, just have fun together. And together time is one of the biggest things that people want. The trend for together time runs right across the whole of the world. This is another thing that's working in your favor, and probably working in favor of the whole leisure, leisure market. And again, through our research there, this re re original um, research we've just done, 81% of parents believe that children learn when they're playing. Isn't that good? Yes, 81%. This is a nationally representative sample. This isn't just um, ABs or, or people who voted for the latest prime minister. These are your customers, these are the national, this is the national sample, which is another really good thing. And 76% say that science museums, getting focused in here, are a good way to assist my child's education. 76%. These are really high figures. These aren't small percentages. And I'm sure we wouldn't have seen this six, seven years ago. Big changes in the way people are viewing their, 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 days, their days out. Good stuff on the back of the ba on the on the back of the bad stuff. Fifty nine percent of people said they visited since twenty seventeen. We kind of chose that date because it's five years and there were COVID issues and all those sort of things, which is quite a high proportion, I think. I don't know what your statistics tell you. That fifty nine percent of people having been 
in one of your centres recently is a, is a high proportion. So is there room to grow this? Well, look at those other ones. Well, you can expect 78% to say cinema, um, but uh, you see 59% is near the bottom of these. I've got the whole list. There's a longer tail than this. You can see well, there's some still more we could get from the market here on 59% saying they've been recently, particularly as uh, all the trends seem to be working in your favour. So um, that's um, what they've been doing. This is the kinds of people, just a few top lines. People who go, people who said they went, they tended to be parents of uh, when they tended to have been as children been taken by their parents. So they've got a history of going to science to science centres. They tended to read newspapers. There was a big bias towards newspaper readers as well, which is unusual. They expected to pay £14. That was their average cost that they expected to pay if they went to a discovery centre, science centre, £8 for children. Now, this was interesting. 80 minutes was the threshold for how far they would drive. 80 minutes is a long time. That provides big catchment areas, particularly for somewhere like Glasgow, that will encompass a whole load of people. Um, and 47% they said they would prefer a national uh, a, a connection to the national curriculum in the work that you do in how you how you entertain people. So some big figures there, and some a little interesting interesting biases into the types of people that like going. But of course that's um, that's all uh, very good, but. Uh, um, can we persuade people? So we've asked them a really critical question. Is science cool? I don't, but, but, but children said, well, but children uh, in their 20s, they said, Dad, cool's not a cool word, actually. It's, <laughs> you're just displaying you're not cool there. But that was the question we were asking. What was, we, so we invented the Brand Vista coolometer. So this is the Brand Vista coolometer here. <laughs> and it's, uh, as you see, we've separated it into three age groups because that's how people mark this very differently. And we gave them 15 things to choose and say whether it's cool or not. And, and this is, this is the, re the response that we got. You will see a difference. 18 to 34 year olds, I wonder if science is going to appear in there. I wonder if it's in the 30, 35 to 54 year olds and so on. So on the left hand side, you can see number one on the coolometer is music, of course. Number two is football. Number three is photography. Number four is theater, interestingly. Um, but look at the 35 to 54 year olds. Science is number three. Number three. Wow. Uh, that's and ahead of football, uh, which is which is amazing there. Um, so science number three. They remember there are 15 of there are 15 of these. And over there in the uh, slightly older category, yes, science is number four. So our parents think science is cool. Uh, that's really interesting, isn't it? I was quite amazed at this. So you can see that the science coolness rank. 13th, I'm afraid, <laughs> in the 18 to 34 year olds, third and then fourth in the older age groups. And I reckon that's gone right up the rankings over the last five or six years. Science has got cooler and cooler. Probably driven by space, things like that, hey, eh, Jazz? <laughs> but of course, those parents who think it is cool have got to actually convince their kids they want to go. So we asked them, how difficult is it to persuade your children to go? So we gave them the same 15 things or a few different things as well. So how difficult, very difficult or quite difficult to persuade your children to go to these things. So very easy, easy. This is the, the coolometer and the, this is the easometer brought into one here. And we arbitrarily chose these percentages because right at the very top there in the very easy category, animal attractions. That's no problem, is it? We all love animal attractions, zoos, safaris, parks, aquariums, things like that. That's the easiest. No persuasion required. And there, easy to persuade. There you go. It's right up there in the second category. Easy to persuade. Not very easy, but easy. Alongside cinema, theme parks and national parks. So uh, interesting, isn't it? How that, I mean, look what's behind you. Amongst the, the, these, are, these are parents with, with young kids, hard to sell, 40 to 49%. And we've got history museums, of course, 
outdoor extreme activity. If you're a young child, you're probably a bit worried about that. Watching a sports event, I'm afraid we may have had a bias to Liverpool fans, though, I'm afraid, Chaz. So um, that's, <laughs> they just find it difficult to persuade them to go. They don't really want to go, but they're dragged along by their parents. And they're doing really, really difficult. We've got concerts and gigs and things, but these, remember, these are parents of young children, so I don't think I made that clear right at the beginning. Of course, art museums, um, uh, things like that, you don't really want to go, do you? I know I didn't. So it is easy to sell. And parents are already bought in. And this is why they go. They go to be learned, to learn and be inspired. Great word, isn't it? Inspired. And 61% say they are good ways of learning new things at educational science centres, science discovery centres, all that, that whole sector. 61% agree that that is a good way of learning. Um, they also say, well, we go, it's inspirational, positive space to spend time, good way to pass the time. And then even to just support science museums and centres, a good way to spend time with family and friends. Lots of good reasons. And there were more reasons as well in the, in the, in the tale there. But you can see lots of positivity around the, um, around the sector, which is very good. But I found this lovely. 81% of consumers agree. Don't just think about kids. It's about us too. We can learn things that we didn't learn when we were at school. There's a reason that I learned everything I know about space when they asked the Book of Planets. It's because I never learned anything at school. I went to a comprehensive, a comprehensive down in Somerset, joy oh joy, and we didn't do anything apart from survive. And now this gives me the chance to learn the stuff that I was never taught. And I, 81% saying, don't forget us, look after us. We've noticed this so much even in, in, um, in other areas where you can't treat the parents just as the bag carriers. They want something out of it as, as well. Because uh, we used to treat the people in theme parks saying, oh, the mums are the bag carriers, so they pay the same amount of money. They'll come in and just happily carry the bags around, or their dads or whoever's not into riding the, riding the rides. Oh, no, they're not putting that up with that anymore. They want something positive from it. 81% saying that they would love to learn something, and they think they're a great way to learn stuff. So, never been a better time. Wow, I'm hope, hopefully that's going to raise the spirits a little bit after that initial, initial depression. But there are hurdles to clear. Um, here's the first one. 28% believe that science museums are too academic. Now, this is perception. Remember, only 59% have been in the last five years. But they're saying, too academic. That's my perception of the, one of the problems, of the barriers you might have to overcome. Um, and we asked them, well, what puts you off? 32% said, oh, nothing puts me off, I'm ready to go. But 32% saying nothing puts me off means, of course, there's 68% who said something, said something had put them off. And these are some of the things they said. Really quite interesting, the first one here. Um, they are too crowded. Perception of one in five saying, nope, oh, it's a barrier, it's too crowded, probably too academic as well, not going. Quite like the idea, it's quite cool, but kids are easy to convince, but I've got worries about this. And the green one there, it's a, the positive element here is the fact that uh, they are not something that, that they are not something that I'm interested in. Only seven percent really validating what we we're talking about earlier that you've got a really strong proposition to consumers at the moment. They are boring. Twelve percent, only twelve percent. I don't know if this is smashing some of those um, perceptions that we might we might have had, but of course these are the this is what people told us. Right then, now. Awareness. Now, if anyone is here from the Science Museum in London, we did a little bit of work with them once upon a time. But 70% of people are aware of the Science Museum. Only 70%? I thought it'd be more than that. But there you go. Um, but let's look at the others. We asked them to name anything. Jodrell Bank, 35%. Um, that was number two. What a gap between number one and number two. And the Space Centre, get in there, 26% coming in in second place but and there was a, again there's a long list that goes away from this but there is still real opportunity around just pure awareness and knowing what's available and where it is so that's another barrier um, and look at that figure 44 percent say oh we've got to go out it's the weekend time we haven't been out as a family i don't know what to do it's time to go out but where do we go so they're Fertile ground for just saying, hey, person who doesn't really know where to go, why don't you come to us? Two more things and then we've sort of finished. This is a huge one. Absolutely huge. Um, this massive trend across the world. Organisations increasingly competing through experience. Um, it doesn't matter what you say in your communications, doesn't matter how you do it. 
it's going to come down to what they experience when they get there. All those things about crowding, all those things about trying to reach all the different people who are in a family unit, that experience, F and B, queuing, all those things are critical. You can do all the advertising, all the comms you want. If you don't get experience right, stuffed. When I, when I was growing up during the, in the 90s, well, I was in business during the 90s, they say bad experience or good experience, you share it with four or five people. Now, of course, you share it with four or five million people. And uh, we know when a ride's doing well or something's doing badly almost instantly. So really important. So experience is important, but also the experience of your colleagues. Those things need to align. They need to be able, the colleague's experience needs to align to the experience you want to give to your customers. Otherwise, it will fall down. We've done this through so many, so many attractions, so many big businesses. Those two things need to be aligned. So experience is the key thing. And this is the last big trend. Oh, no, sorry, this isn't the last bit. This is a figure. 89% <laughs> of companies say they compete on experience nowadays. 89%? That is enormous. 36% five years ago. What a change. 89% say the number one thing they, they compete on is experience. It was 36% five years ago. Whoa. What a big change. Now we come to the last one. This is, this is when you do groups, when you're talking to people, and you talk about queuing or F and B or the experience of the theater or all those sorts of things, people start comparing not just within your sector, but outside your sector as well. So I've just chosen Amazon here because um, they go compare the service levels and all those things with the best in class of giving that particular part of the service. This is a quote, um, really like this quote. The days of brands competing with each other within category is over. Customers will compare the experience they have within the automotive category of that to supermarkets, hotels, and sports brands. Land Rover, Laura's the CEO of Land Rover. So yeah, all right, so if our queuing system, they're not just comparing us there within the sector, they're comparing us to what else they can get in, 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 um, in uh, Waitrose or something like that, not ever go there. But you see what I mean? You've got to maintain raising standards, benchmarks are changing all the time. So that's uh, a quick whiz through that great mix of stuff that we've got. So, so we've got some other stuff back um, that well, I haven't gone through today. So um, you've got to know your customer's shoes. You've got to really understand them. And it's really hard to do that without doing research, without talking to them in focus groups or one-to-one -one and using techniques to get under the skin and don't just ask questions. You delve and you dig and you find out what's really, what's really affecting you. People are massively stressed at the moment. And they're looking at every penny that they spend. You don't need me to tell you that. But it's never been a better time. I hope you saw those figures. Thought, Whoa, this is a really good opportunity for us. But you've got some real hurdles to clear. Uh, let's go back to Strange Ways. Uh, so I've got to get from finish where we started here. Strange Ways, that question I was asked. Who do you support? The question that would, <laughs> the answer to which would allow me to either get out or not, or not get out. Well, I sat there for a while and um, I, I didn't, didn't really answer them. But if they had only understood the shoes that I was wearing, we probably, I, I probably wouldn't have got out because there they are. My Chelsea boots. <laughs> <laughs> I would have died <laughs> if that would have got out, if that had got out. Anyway, um, thank you very much. I've, what I've got here is this is, um, <laughs> this is a bit cheeky, but that's, uh, that's, that's who I am. And there's my phone number. I'll read it out. And hopefully some of you will remember it <laughs> in about five years' time. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, no, no, actually, oh, uh, to be honest, we're running a little yeah. bit late. Yeah, all right, okay, really... 26. Uh, yeah, in fact, we're not running late, we're running absolutely on time. That was blinding. Thank you so much. Thank you for the insights, and we'll be uh, sharing the recording of that and also the slides, and, and yeah, if we can get any more information from the bulk of research that uh, you and your colleagues have done, that is fantastic. Okay. That was absolutely perfect. Thank you so much. And um, if, you, if you are, um, we are, have got a next session coming up. Uh, so if you are staying in the, uh, in the IMAX, let me have a quick look at where we are. Um, in the IMAX at the moment is coordinating STEM engagement on a national scale. Uh, the National Climate Campaign with the Scottish Science Network is in here. But um, 
Uh, Gary, I think you're around for another half hour or mm -hmm. so. So, uh, yeah, if you do have any questions, and I'm sure you do, that you would like to quiz Gary on whilst he's still here, uh, then please do come and talk to him. Uh, uh, one thing I wanted to mention as well, um, uh, Chaz and Linda are curating a, a conversation in the Bossy after this. It's called uh, From One Crisis to Another, Reconnecting with Your Audience. And that very nicely leaps off from some of these big themes um, that you know have been put in front of us today. And we also have a fantastic panel uh, up in Science Show Theatre. And this is something that has, is, a, is a complete challenge for our sector and something that we urgently need to address. And it's about accessible recruitment and us as inclusive employers. So who are you missing? Uh, that's a panel up in the Science Show Theatre. Uh, but for now, another, another th warm thank you to Gary Moss. Thank you very much for coming. And if you're... Happy to loiter around at the front for a bit. Anyone can come and uh, ask questions. We've got 10 minutes to move if you're moving elsewhere. Thank you. <laughs>